Log entry, the Catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, 36 degrees, 9 minutes south, 153 degrees, 17 minutes east. Wind light, sky fair. Remarks, departed Sydney, Australia after involvement in British law. Reason for involvement, the Queen Anne pistols and the dealer on King George Road. We spent three days in the bustling harbor of Melbourne on our run up the eastern Australian coast to Sydney. We put a general cargo into our holds, and by sunset of the third day, we were ready to cast off and clear port on the ebbing tide. Stand by to cast off! Come on, let me out there where we can turn the boat. My chief mate Gallagher balled the crew out of their quarters and into that position with the hawser. I started the motor and turned back to give the go-ahead to two crewmen standing ready to heave the gangway aboard. Hey, Captain! There's a light visitor wanting to come aboard! An undernourished-looking character in well-worn tweed stood on the dock near the gangway. He was waving a paper-wrapped box in my direction. Hey, Captain Carney, hold up. I've got a package I'd like to take you to Sydney with you. If be paid well. All right, bring it aboard. Thanks, Captain. I'm Leonard Bonney, Captain. I learned in the shipping office in the nick of time as how you was journeying to Sydney. Oh, did you clear the package through the office? Oh, yes, here's the papers. Uh Uh-huh. I'd express it, you know, but they handle things so badly, and I'd like to have it delivered personally. To who? uh, An antique gun shop at 272 King George Road, Sydney. Bloke's a fat gent named uh, Arthur Worthing. He'll pay you handsome. That's fair enough. What is it? Yeah, just a small box, Captain. But, uh, have a care... It's holding a brace of 18th century pistols, and if the truth were known, Captain, more than one murder has been committed, not only by them, but over them. <laughs> well, pleasant voyage, Captain. Pleasant voyage. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tolman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log, and every week, a league further in the voyage of the Scarlet Queen. address in Sydney that Leonard Bonney had given me was easy to find. But except for a sign and a few dusty weapons in the window, the establishment behind it looked more like an office for rent than a gun shop. Well, good day, sir. Hello. You Arthur Worthing? Yes. I'm Philip Carney, master of the Catch Scarlet Queen. Uh huh. Mr. Bonney telegraphed me to expect you. The package, sir. Yeah, here it is. Are you a fancy alarm, sir? No, nothing, Auntie. <laughs> There, sir. Two masterpieces from the shop of James Freeman Norwich, circa 1705, sir. Perfect examples of the early gunsmith's art, sir. The box he opened was leather-bound and satin-lined. Happy this item, sir. The two pistols that nestled in it were graceful flintlocks with ten-inch forged barrels, upon which were engraved a coronet and a name so faint that I couldn't make it out. These pistols, Captain, were fashioned during Queen Anne's reign. Yeah, well, I'm glad I was able to get them to you. Yes, uh, tell me, what do you think of the price of them? Twenty thousand pounds. Oh, as long as I'm not buying them, it's all right with me. <laughs> Indeed, sir. A shrewd return. Yeah. Now, your payment. Considering the outlay of personal time and interest, shall we say the equivalent of one hundred dollars, sir? Well, oh, that's more than enough, Worthing. Indeed, but, uh, there's a purpose behind my generosity. Oh? Huh? You're perhaps not familiar with the uh, plots and counterplots of those who haggle over objects of extreme value. Secrecy is a most valuable adjunct. Do you follow? No, I think so. That's why the pistols were shipped with me. Exactly. Now, if I were to step from this establishment, sir, to make the final transfer, my adversaries would become immediately aware of the presence of the Queen Anne pistols here in Sydney. 
Oh, and since I'm a stranger... Exactly. Mm -hmm. Your movements would mean nothing. Captain Carney, I will double the freightage price, sir, in advance, if you will carry the pistols upon the final crucial leg of the journey. Well? Where do they go? (laughs) Splendid, Captain. Here you are, sir. Slightly more than the original figure. Mm, Yeah. It's about two pounds over. You want change? Bosh, sir. Hack fair and perhaps a splash on the way. <laughs> uh, leave the address, Victoria Drive. Large residence, bit too ornate for my taste. On the left flank as you approach it from the east. Yeah, I'll be able to find it. What's the name? Mr. and Mrs. Jack Rawlins Hartford. Ask for either one. But give the pistols to nobody else. Yeah, and the money for them, that 20,000 pounds? Ah, uh, sir. The collection of that is up to me. Tell them that either Mr. Bonnie or myself will contact them at the earliest opportunity. Agreed? Well, fair enough. Oh, and one thing more, Captain. Yeah. You will be followed and watched, sir, until the delivery has been completed. Oh, Mrs. Hartford? Yes. What did you want? I'm here to deliver this package to you. Oh, thank you. Mm-hmm. Can't remember ordering anything. Who is it from? Uh, Mr. Arthur Worthing. Arthur Worthing? I don't know any... Ar- <gasps> oh, no. What's the matter? No, you... You... You couldn't... What's the matter, Mrs. Hartford? Aren't they the right one? Yes, still, no, what's the trouble? Who's this man? What is he? Good Lord, no. Where did they come from? I brought them. Estelle, go up to your room. No. No, Jack, I want to know. What does it mean, Jack? What does it mean? Be quiet, Estelle. Go up to your room. But, Jack, it's important that I know what all this means. You've got to tell me. Now, sir, what do you want? I don't want anything. I was paid to bring these pistols up from Melbourne. I got them from a man named Bonnie. Leonard Bonnie. He's here in Australia. That's right. I delivered them to a man named Arthur Worthing down on King George Road. Then he hired me to bring them out here to you. Who is Arthur Worthing? I don't know. I took it that he knew you. That you wanted to buy these pistols. That's what he said. And what is the sales price? 20,000 pounds and they'll contact... 20,000? That's impossible. Bonnie's insane. Oh, wait a minute, Hartford. What's the 45 for? Go back to Bonnie and your Arthur Worthing. Tell them the price is too high for either of us. Tell them I'm reporting your visit to the police. Now get out. That's a good idea, Hartford, but after five minutes in this house, I don't need an automatic to make me want to leave. I didn't bother with the leather-bound box, but I scooped up the Queen Anne pistols, shoved them into my belt, and took the shortest route back to Arthur Worthing's gun shop on King George Road. I should have saved myself the anger I'd built up on the way. The place was not only locked, it was empty. And Arthur Worthing's sign had been replaced by another that said, Office for Rent, Inquire Number 13, Grove Square. I decided not to. Instead, I went back to the Queen and tossed the pistols into my desk drawer. Gallagher! Hey, Red! Captain Carney, the chief in the rest of the crew's gone ashore. Oh, okay, Kohler. I hope they have better luck than I did. No good, sir? Rotten. Everybody's nuts in this port. Now, you're lucky to be aboard. Hey, I may have a visitor or two. Give me a hail before you let them on, huh? Okay, sir. I looked the pistols over, but I couldn't find anything that would make them worth either 20,000 pounds or the trouble of a mysterious disappearance. They were just what they looked like, a pair of old pistols. Under a strong light, I did make out the engraved name that I hadn't been able to read when Worthing showed them to me. It was Hartford, as in Mr. and Mrs. Jack Rawlins Hartford. Captain Carney! Look yeah! Like that visitor's bearing down on us! Okay, Kohler. I stuck my head out of the companionway far enough to see a familiar, undernourished figure in ratty tweeds making for the gangway. It's all right, Kohler, let him aboard! Well, Mr. Bonnie, come on in. What I had in mind, Captain, I want to talk to you. You got that wrong. I want to talk to you. Oh, come hey, in. Now, 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 what's all this? I looked at too many guns today to let you keep one that I don't see. You let go of me. Sure. We'll feel a lot easier about one another with this Webley out in the open. All right, sit down. All right, all right. What makes those Queen Anne pistols so important, Bonnie? Well, there's them that likes old things, you know. Well, I think told you they was worth 20000 Yeah, and more from what I've seen and heard. You shipped those pistols up from Melbourne with me and then arrived a few hours later yourself. Why? 
because it wasn't healthy for you to arrive together? Blimey, you've got an head on your shoulders, haven't you? Now, why don't you use it, matey? Hartford didn't take them pistols, so you must still have them. What about handing them over? No. Yeah, no. What do you want, chum? A share for yourself? I might. But first, I want to know how I can keep myself clear. I don't know why, but I know they're hot. That puts me in a bad spot. How do I know the local bobbies won't be calling on me? Come to think of it, I don't suppose you do know, do you? Two hundred dollars of Worthing's money in your pocket for bringing the pistols and crawling on the Artfords. I don't suppose you'd like it if they did. Now, would you, huh? Especially considering the stories Worthing and me would tell about you if we was pinched along with you. Who rehearsed you in that pitch, Bonnie? And where is the fat boy? Oh, he's waiting, patient at the hotel. Fetch the pistols, Captain, and we'll go far. Without the pistols, Bonnie. I think I can talk louder if they stay right where they are. Who is this? It's Bonnie. I brought the captain. Well, Captain Bonnie. So, we meet again, Captain Carr. Yeah, we meet again. Come in quickly. Yes. Now the pistols, sir. Give them to me. I didn't bring them. What's that? Well, in heaven's name, why not? What do you hope to gain by working at cross purposes? I don't want to gain anything. I just want to break even. I want to stay clear of the law so my sailing won't be delayed. If I can do that by keeping those pistols out of sight, they stay where they are until I leave. Then I drop them over the side. (laughs) All right, sir. I may as well tell you. The pistols are of no consequence whatsoever. Half a mo now, Worthing. They were important enough, right enough in London when first we talked about coming out here with them, uh, weren't they? Of course they were, Bunny. Of course they were. But now they've served their purpose. The Hartfords have seen them, my boy, and now they know that we are close upon their heels. We put the fear of the devil into them. Now, Bunny, it only remains for you to collect the money. Yes. <laughs> the end of the path, Bunny. So you see, Captain, you may have your precious pistols. Yeah, I see quite a few things. Blackmail, huh? Of the grossest sort, sir. But intricately and patiently contrived by Bonnie and me, so that now its profitable culmination is at hand. We will be handsomely paid by the Hartfords to keep secret a murder of which they are guilty. I think we need them pistols. Nonsense, my boy. They have no consequence. Eliminate them from your mind. Then I guess that leaves me out, doesn't it, Worthing? I can go? Uh Uh-huh. To clear yourself of the police, indeed you cannot. You value your ship's schedule too highly, sir, for me to allow you your liberty now. Now, the finish be brought into such sharp focus. Now, see if the captain has come bearing arms, Bonnie, whilst I control him with my own. Right you are, and with pleasure, too. All right, you can save yourself the trouble. Well, just have a look to be sure. No tricks now. I hope the judgment will hold you in check, Captain. If he does not, I should be forced to kill you. Upon my word, sir. I mean that. Save the threats, Worthing. Get this punk off of me. Uh, he's not carrying anything, not even a blade. Uh, what now, Worthing? Unless you really want to use that gun, don't push me too hard. Oh, come now, Captain. Change your attitude. I said what now, Worthing? I'm afraid, sir, that your ship is an ideal rendezvous for a final meeting between Mr. and Mrs. Hartford and myself. My ship? The city of this size? How far am I supposed to let you drag me into this? Surely, sir, since you have no choice, one more step is hardly a point over which to argue. And I would be alone with you. Perhaps you will find your chance to attack and overpower me. What do you think of that, sir? Maybe it'll be worth it. (laughs) Hold on now, Worthing. Hold on. Where will I be while this here meeting's taking place? You, Bonnie, will be right here, waiting word for me. When you receive it, you will go straightway to the Hartford residence, where they'll be waiting for you with the initial payment of our 20,000 pounds. The game is won, my boy. Right you are, Worthing, and a long one it's been, too. Yes, indeed it has, Bonnie. What a splendid quest. Now the Hartfords will be waiting for my phone call. Ready to purchase from us a peaceful future for themselves. Power, Bonnie. Power as is held by few men. The power to deal in freedom. Indeed, more than that, the power to sell life itself. In here, in the cabin here, if you please. Captain and I are waiting. Oh, well, Mr. and Mrs. Hartford, later Lawrence, Lawrence. most distasteful. Our powers meet at last. Uh, Martha Worthing, 
You don't know me, but I assure you yourself. You remember Captain Carney, of course? Oh, yes. Quite. Yeah, they probably do. Yes, we remember the captain. I'm afraid I have distressing news for you. News directly attributable to Captain Carney's interference. He has gained possession of the pistols. Steadfastly refuses to part with them. He's a thorn in my side. Do you expect sympathy from us, Mr. Worthing? I expect nothing from you, Mrs. Hartford. No more than your uncle, the Marquis of Hartford, could have expected from you had he known your true thoughts before you had him murdered. Are you lecturing, Mr. Worthing? You're planning to profit from the same death. Yes. Quite a profitable death to everyone but the Marquis. His estate is fortune to you and to the others of us who nibble at the edges a small share. Even to the captain here, some two hundred dollars. If I do anything with it, I'll post it as a reward on your head, Worthy. <laughs> Indeed, yes, I believe you would, sir. Dead or alive, no doubt. All right, cut this short, will you, Worthing? It's too rich a diet for me. I'm going to be sick any minute. Yes, you are. Well, now, Mr. and Mrs. Hartford, you both understand the terms that Leonard, Bonnie, and I have decided upon. We will maintain complete silence in regard to your responsibility in the matter of the murder of your uncle, the Mark of Hartford, between 6 and 7 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, October 8th, 1945. At which time, according to the knowledge shared by all of us here, a killer, hired by yourselves, did shoot said Marquis to death. Understood? How can we be sure of your silence if, as you say, Captain Carney refuses to give up the pistols? Yeah, have you thought of that, Worthing? <laughs> Indeed I have, sir. Unfortunate, but of minor importance. The theft of the pistols, according to your plans, was to be the generally accepted motive for the murder, in view of their great value. <laughs> Since they did indeed disappear. But... Why worry? Who, who would correlate them with the true story except us? We could never be sure. My word will be kept. But that blackguard Bonnie, I, I readily admit, I, I don't know. The proof of your guilt lives with him. He may decide that he needs more money one day, but... Yes, well, back to the matter at hand. The cost to you, Mr. and Mrs. Hartford, is 20,000 pounds. 5,000 of it to be paid tonight to Bonnie, who will meet you at your home. The rest is in the next seven days. Well, I... I don't see how that's going to be possible. <laughs> oh, come now. It must be possible. Let's just spend the rest of your days in the murderer's cage. Surely rather than sacrifice the gracious life you now I, need... I... I don't know. The time is so short. We'll manage, Estelle. There must be a way. We have the 5,000. Bonnie will arrive at your home soon after you do to collect. But now Captain Carney has heard the story. Now, you don't think for a minute that it was by accident, do you? But he knows... What good is buying your silence when first he knows, then someone else, and then someone else? I can't stand it, I tell you. I can't stand it. Convince her, Hartford. Convince her that there's no reason to fear Captain Carney's knowledge. I have my own plans for him. He'll not use his knowledge. You may be sure of that. I shall see to that myself. Take an hour and go to meet Bonnie. Yes, come, Estelle. Oh, my God. We'll go and meet Bonnie. And now, Captain Carney. Oh! I hit him. I'd waited for the first show of carelessness in him, and it came as the Hartfords left the cabin as though a whole attitude dropped from him. Tony, wait! Uh, you fool! Wait! Uh, uh, wait, Worthing! Oh, me. wait! Stop! Stop! Oh, sure, Worthing, why not? Sure, I'll stop! I stood over him, looking down at the red trickle from his flabby mouth. I started toward the companionway with my keys out and ready to lock him into the cabin while I headed for the law. But I stopped because I suddenly realized that he'd done nothing but try to keep me from hitting him. I leaned down and pulled his collar loose. He hadn't even tried to use the gun on me. I decided to find out what I could myself before I nursed him back for questions. The wallet in his hip pocket held nothing but money and a card with his name on it. His inside coat pocket gave me a week old receipt for the weapons with which he'd dressed up his fake gun shop. I patted his side coat pockets. Down at the bottom of the right one, I felt a thin rectangular object. Oh. It was inside the coat lining. I got my fingers into the seam oh. and ripped. Uh -huh. The object was a card set into a plate of transparent plastic. Money. It had his picture and his fingerprints. And it said, Arthur Worthing, Special Investigator, Homicide Bureau, Scotland Yard. All right, come on, Inspector Worthing. Come on. Huh? Here, drink this. Yeah. Attaboy. Rather strong. 
Uh, well, sir, I, I must say you're a splendid ally, Captain Carney. Yeah, it would help you know if your allies knew they were allies instead of pigeons. Yeah, take another drink. Yes, pigeon, indeed. Hmm? <coughs> That's it. You know, Captain Carney, hmm? I've been posing as a blackmailer for so long that I scarcely knew what I was myself. I couldn't shed my disguise in front of you until the last details were sorted and sliding in the direction of final solution. Yeah. You didn't by any chance drag me down here to the ship just so you'd have a witness for the Hartford's confession, did you? <laughs> yes, Connie, you are the alert one. I may yet need your statement. Now, we must go. There's work and bloodshed before us. You said us. I did indeed, sir. Did you have in mind our stopping the Hartfords before they commit another murder? Or after? That's an odd question, sir. Not since this is making sense, it isn't. Not since you baited Hartford with the idea that Bonnie was the only one that could prove them guilty of murdering their uncle. And impeccable truth, sir. Yeah? Bonnie is the one they hired to kill him. Uh Uh-huh. Good heavens, sir. Do you suppose they may attempt to silence him by fatal methods? No more fatal than the forty-five Hartford pointed at me. If we don't get there in time to stop him. Well, now, your suggestion does bring to light an interesting possibility. Oh? Uh-huh. If, sir, if, for example, the Hartfords are apprehended at the scene attempting to murder that miserable little cutthroat Leonard Bonney, then, sir, the Crown would have legal grounds to retry the Hartfords for the original murder of the Marquis, would they not now? <laughs> By Jove, I believe you've hit the nail squarely on the head, Captain. I think you hit the same nail when you palled up with Bonnie and talked him into coming out here with blackmail in mind. You do. Well, thank you. You know, I think I can get there in time to save Bonnie. Why not? Why not make a sporting proposition of it? We don't have much to work with for sport. Well, we have you, sir, and me, sir. You unblemished to race to the Hartford residence. On the other hand, myself. Oh, wait. Unable to run. Able only to hobble to the nearest telephone and give Bonnie his orders and summon the Sydney police to meet you at Hartford's. It is a contest, sir. (laughs) Physically, I don't know, but psychologically, Inspector Worthing, you're a devil of a tough competitor. (laughs) Indeed. Well, thank you, sir. Save your breath. The race is not yet run. driver. Thanks, Jump. Good evening to you. Yeah, good night. I dropped my cab a half a block down from the Hartford address. When I got abreast of the grounds, I left the sidewalk and skirted through the shrubs. I kept my eyes and ears open for sight or sound of the police, but I didn't spot any. There was a light in the library where I'd been received earlier that day, and I angled over toward it. Suddenly, in the faint glow from the street lamps, I could see a swarm of uniformed figures slipping silently toward the house. I don't know how Worthing timed it. Maybe he'd ordered Bonnie to spot me on the sidewalk before he went inside. Now, no, wait a minute, Hartford. Through the window, I could see Bonnie standing rigid with fear. Hartford was at ease, holding the forty-five in a steady hand. I started to run, still hoping I could stop him. No, Hartford. I'll give it up. Wait a minute, Hartford! Over to England. Hartford, you'll never get out! Hartford! <laughs> Inspector Worthing only once more when I took the Queen Anne pistols to him and watched him wrap them for shipment back to the Hartford Estate in Norwich, England. By three that afternoon, we battened the hatches over a new cargo and headed out of Sydney Harbor into the Pacific wind. It had been an Australian holiday for the crew and they scrambled to their stations with all the verve of eager cadets. Stop it, Chief! Make sail! The sheaves groaned and the mainsail was muffled aloft. The jib went out. Then the mizzen and the Scarlet Queen rolled lazily out toward a westing sun. Well, Skipper, she's slow, but she's easy. Yeah, we move when the wind does, Red, but it's all right with me. A nice port. 
Sidney, has kidnapped. All right, lay off. Well, you should have taken a nice, easy, normal approach with me. Yeah, what'd you do? Oh, <laughs> dinner, found an American movie, a couple of bars, and then a nice, wide hotel bed. <laughs> they took it really easy. Yeah, yeah, that's the life. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's the matter? What are you looking at? Your eye. It's puffed and the black is showing through that stuff you got on it. Quiet night, huh? Oh, uh, <laughs> does that happen? Yeah, when, uh... yeah, sure, Red. No trouble at all. Yeah, well, I'll tell you about it later. What a brunette. <laughs> oh, what the devil. What are ports for if they aren't for stirring up a little land trouble when you hit them? That's a trick I never learned not to do, Red. Well, we got a nice snug home to run away in. To the Queen, Skipper. To the Scarlet Queen. After you, mate. After you. Log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, 5.30 p.m. Wind light, sky fair, sea calm with easy cross swell. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney. Master. Mutual invites you to sail into further adventure on the voyage of the Scarlet Queen next week at this same time. Porto Call, Singapore. The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher. And tonight featured Barry Kroger as Worthing. Tony Ellis was Bonnie, Anne Stone Estelle, Eric Snowden played Hartford, and Ray Kemper was Kohler. The Scarlet Queen, produced by James Burton, is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. 